I'm going to move on to a new topic in the faith education series of homilies. We're almost to the good stuff, I promise. But uh, uh, I will generally call this topic the last things. Um, the last things, they're sometimes referred to as the four last things, is a term that's given to summarize four major topics. And those topics are death, judgment, <clears throat> heaven, and hell. And I'm going to uh, throw purgatory and the saints into this category as well. They kind of fit here. Um, and I plan on this being a uh, four, four homily series, this topic, but with a bit of a twist because we have a holy day coming up on Monday and Tuesday, uh, the Feast of the Assumption. I will be talking about Mary and the saints on that day. So if you want the whole picture of the four last things, make sure to be here for that holy day or at least listen to this homily some other time. So today... <clears throat> I, would, I thought I would begin this topic by uh, the cheery way by talking about heaven. Uh, but first we have to talk about a couple of less cheery things, and that is death and judgment. So uh, the theological definition of death is the separation of one's soul from one's body. Our soul, once it's created at the moment of our creation, is eternal. Uh, it'll never end. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, he defines the soul as the, quote, first principle of life potential within a natural body. And in English, uh, that means that uh, the soul is what animates your body. Uh, your soul gives your body life. While the physical material of your body is constantly changing by eating and by aging, uh, uh, your soul is permanent. You may have heard it said, uh, at some point in your life that you have a soul, but in actuality, you are a soul. Uh, your soul is how you are identified and different from the rest of creation. It's what makes you unique. And that's why the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell, depend on the state of your soul, uh, because your soul is you. Physical death happens when your body is no longer capable of being a sufficient companion to your soul, either by age or sickness or physical trauma. Uh, spiritual death is different, and that's something that we'll talk about uh, at a later time. All right, so that's death. Now let's talk about judgment. Uh, this is what the Catechism says about judgment. This is paragraph 1021. Death puts an end to human life as the time open to either accepting or rejecting the divine grace manifested in Christ. The New Testament speaks of judgment primarily in its aspect of the final encounter with Christ in his second coming, but it also reportedly affirms that each person will be, re will be rewarded immediately after death in accordance with his works and faith. So what the Catechism here is telling us is that <clears throat> there are two judgments, or judgment happens on two levels, one at the end of the world, when Jesus returns to judge the living and the dead. And the second judgment is that each person will face what is called his or her particular judgment at the end of our lives. Uh, the catechism continues. This is the next paragraph, 1022. Each person receives their eternal retribution in their immortal soul at the very moment of their death in a particular judgment that refers his or her life to Christ. Either entrance into the blessedness of heaven through a purification or immediately, or immediate and everlasting damnation. So what the Catechism lays out, there's basically three possibilities after death. Heaven through purification, which we call purgatory, heaven immediately, or damnation immediately and eternally, which is what we call hell. And we'll cover all of these topics individually, but today we're going to talk about heaven. <clears throat> so first of all, how do you get to heaven? Well, the Catechism says this, Those who die in God's grace and friendship and are perfectly purified live forever with Christ. So what does that mean? Well, dying in a state of grace means that we are in a relationship with God at the end of our life. Uh, and that essentially means that we have accepted a relationship with God, that we've not outright and blatantly uh, rejected him. And that's a, a pretty generous level of qualification for heaven, if you think about it, simply not rejecting God and having some sort of relationship for him. He very uh, mercifully sets the bar pretty low for us uh, to get to heaven, but we have to pay attention to the other part of the qualification listed in that definition that the Catechism gives us. It says that those who die in God's grace and friendship, so that's one qualification, and are perfectly purified, 
live forever with Christ. So what does perfectly purified mean? Well, it means that you're free from sin, and also you're free from any attachment or effect of your own personal sins. Some people do, in fact, meet these qualifications at the moment of their death for immediate entry into heaven. We call them the saints, and we'll talk about them in a couple of days on the Holy Day. But for those who do not die in the state of sainthood, there is purgatory, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. Uh, Purgatory is where our purification and preparation for heaven is completed. We've sort of cleared the bar, but uh, but we haven't <clears throat> we haven't gotten to the end of, of our journey yet, spiritually speaking. So that's death, judgment, and how to get to heaven. But I, probably the question that we all wonder is, what is heaven like? I don't know. I've never been there. Uh, but for most people, I would be willing to bet, especially in the modern secular world that we live in, that heaven sounds rather boring to them. Uh, I would be willing to bet that their notion of rising from the dead is far less interesting than what it actually is or uh, you know they probably think about the cartoons they saw growing up or whatever it was uh, that you're playing a harp sitting on a cloud with a halo above your head or even worse you're praying the whole time like what a drag who would want to be there and uh, there's some people who probably think of rising from the dead or life after death is basically just you get to keep on living Um, you know like you've been resuscitated by a, a doctor or something like that or like Lazarus, when Jesus raises him from the dead, he just kind of goes about living his life again. Um, but uh, the resurrection, life after death in the resurrection, is nothing like that. If you read the scriptures carefully, it is clear that Jesus' resurrection wasn't about just getting to live again after you die. It is about breaking into an entirely new form of life, a new way of existing a new way of existing that makes our previous existence seem like it was just a warm-up act. Um, So after his resurrection, for example, Jesus is no longer bound by space or time. He appears in more than one place at once. Distance makes no difference to him. He can go where he wants to uh, without, you know, anything being in his way. He travels where he wants. There's something mysterious about his appearance after he is risen because He can only be recognized, even by his closest friends, only when he wants them to, um, uh, only when he wishes them to recognize him. And yet, at the same time, he's human. He walks, he talks, he eats, and every single resurrection story, Jesus is eating something, it seems like. Um, And he spends 40 days teaching his apostles, and all of that is possible because the resurrection is, um, it's foreshadowed by this life, but it's nothing like this life. It is entirely different than simply living on some more and living on forever. Uh, We will experience uh, something entirely new. Now, I've done this before. I believe it was Easter a few years ago. I can't even remember why I did this. But, um, well, yeah, I was talking about the resurrection, obviously, Easter. But uh, anyway, so the the best explanation of eternity and heaven that I've ever come across is in a children's book, uh, the, the very last chapters of C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. If you're not familiar, the Chronicles of Narnia are about this, you know, this sort of uh, fantasy land that a series of children visit over the course of seven books. So when I say Narnia, it's, the, it's a location, it's like this place. And uh, at the end, it's sort of like an allegory for the Bible. So there's a creation story in the beginning, and at the end, there's sort of a book of Revelation, and that's what this is. So I'm going to spoil the whole thing for you. Uh, but it's been out for like 70 years, so uh, you've had enough time, I think, to read it on your own. But uh, so there's going to be a lot of like names and uh, animals talking and things like that. I, I'm not going to explain everything. Just listen to the imagery because that's the important part uh, that I think explains heaven rather well. The eagle is right, said the Lord Diggory. Listen, Peter, when Aslan, Aslan is like, Narnia's version of Jesus. Uh, When Aslan said that you could never go back to Narnia, he meant the Narnia that you were thinking of, but that was not the real Narnia. That had a beginning and an end. It was only a shadow or a copy of the real Narnia, which has always been here and always will be here. You need not mourn over Narnia, Lucy. All of the old Narnia that mattered, all the dear creatures, have been drawn into the real Narnia, and of course it is different, as different as a real thing is from a shadow or as waking life is from a dream. 
It is as hard to explain how this sunlit land was different from the old Narnia as it would be to tell you how the fruits of that country taste. Perhaps you will get some idea if you think of it like this. You may have been in a room in which there was a window that looked out on a lovely bay of the sea or a green valley that wound away among the mountains. And in the wall of that room opposite the window, there may have been a mirror. And as you turned away from the window, you suddenly caught sight of that same sea or that same valley all over again in the mirror. Except the sea in that mirror, or the valley in that mirror, were in one sense just the same as the real ones, yet at the same time they were somehow different, deeper, more wonderful, more like places in a story, in a story that you've never heard but very much want to know. The difference between the old Narnia and the new Narnia was like that. The new one was a deeper country. Every rock and every flower and every blade of grass looked as if it had more meaning. I can't describe it any better than that. If you ever get there, you'll know what I mean. It was the unicorn who summed up what everybody else was feeling. He stamped his right forehoof on the ground and neighed, and then he cried, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land that I've been looking for all of my life, though I never knew it until now. The reason why we loved the old Narnia was that it sometimes looked a little bit like this. Come further up, further in. He shook his mane and sprang forward into a great gallop, a unicorn's gallop, which in our world would have carried him out of sight in a few moments. But now a most strange thing happened. Everybody else began to run, and they found to their astonishment that they could keep up with him. Not only the dogs and the humans, but even fat little Puzzle, the donkey, and the short-legged uh, Pagan, the dwarf. The air flew past as they were driving, as if they were driving in a fast car without a windshield. The country flew past as if they were seeing it from the windows of a the speeding express train. Faster and faster they raced, but no one got hot or tired or out of breath. We're going to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, they find the castle, and they go into the castle, and there's a garden inside the castle walls. And in the middle of this garden is another version of Narnia once again. And they go into that one, and it begins to uh, pick it up again. About half an hour later... Or it might have been half a hundred years later, for time there is not like time here. Lucy stood with her dear friend, her oldest Narnian friend, the fawn Mr. Tumnus, looking down over the wall of that garden and seeing all of Narnia spread out below. But when you looked down, you found that this hill was much higher than you had thought. It sank down with shining cliffs thousands of feet below them, and trees in that lower world looked no bigger than grains of green salt. Then she turned inward again and stood with her back to the wall and looked at the garden. I see, she said at last, thoughtfully. I see now the garden is far bigger on the inside than it was on the outside. Of course, daughter of Eve, said the fawn, the further up and the further in you go, the bigger everything gets. The inside is larger than the outside. Lucy looked hard at the garden and saw that it was not really a garden at all, but a whole world with its own rivers and woods and sea and mountains. They were not strange. She knew them all. I see, she said. This is still Narnia, and more real and more beautiful than the Narnia down below, just as it was more real and more beautiful than the old Narnia, a world within a world. Yes, said Mr. Thomas, like an onion, except as you go in and in, each circle is larger than the last. And skipping to the last paragraph of the story, Lucy saw that a great series of many-colored cliffs led up in front of them like a giant staircase. And, when she, and then she forgot everything else, because Aslan himself was coming, leaping down from cliff to cliff like a living cataract of power and beauty. And as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, but the things that began to happen after that were so great and so beautiful that I cannot write them. And, uh, and for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they lived happily ever after, but for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All of their life on this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. So people think that heaven is a place where we will stay forever. But heaven isn't a place. It's a whole new reality. All of the good things that we enjoy here in life are just a foretaste of the actual truth that we'll experience in the next. The next life is a whole new way of existing. The word forever, theologically speaking, doesn't mean a really, really, really long time, because there is no time in heaven. Uh, eternity is a quality. 
not a quantity. It's something whose depths can never be exhausted, whose mysteries can never be solved. The truth is, is that people who think heaven is boring, well, those people are boring. Their idea of who God is is boring. Uh, but God, God is always showing us something new and something amazing. He's always surprising us and taking us to places where we never imagined we could be. So to say that heaven or the resurrection simply means that you get to live again after you die, it's the biggest understatement in all of human history. The resurrection means that once you die, only then do you truly begin to live. As Catholics, we honor the saints. We, of course, do not worship the saints. It is only fitting to give worship to God. Anything else is the sin of idolatry, the worship of a false god. And this is, uh, the honoring of the saints is very scandalous to other Christians, as if we are sort of taking something away from Jesus, taking the focus away from Jesus by giving honor to the saints. And they see statues of saints in our houses and shrines and churches and think that we are, in fact, worshiping idols, when in reality they are statues of former Nebraska football players and coaches all around Memorial Stadium, and they don't mention that as idolatry at all, even though it actually is idolatry. Um, uh, it's worshipped far more than any statue in a Catholic church. So why do Catholics honor the saints? Well, we honor the saints because they have lived lives of heroic virtue in following Jesus. The saints provide for us an example and a witness um, of, of what it means to be a true disciple of Christ. And uh, we admire them and, and honor them because their prayers strengthen us. They give us the strength and hope to persevere in our own lives as Christians. And, and uh, they go even beyond that. They show us what is possible in terms of virtue and holiness that, uh, that can actually be achieved. Now, there are some saints that are meant to be imitated, you know, saints that we can follow their practices in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, but there are also saints that went to such extremes that most people are not called to imitate them. Uh, they're meant to be admired. You don't have to live your life like uh, Padre Pio in order to make it to heaven. That's just his path, not necessarily yours. And this is why we often pray to the saints uh, in intercession. When I say pray to the saints, we're not praying to them in the same sense that when we give worship to God, we're praying. When we pray to the saints, we're simply asking for their help. We're asking them to pray for us. Um, so the saints, their prayers are valuable and worth being uh, interceded uh, upon because uh, they are in an intimate communion with God in heaven. They are infinitely closer to God than we are. Uh, and so their prayers are far more perfect and in line with God's will, with God's plan. And so that's what makes their prayers so much more effective than ours. And it always seems to me that the more people you have praying for you, the better. So I don't know why you wouldn't want the saints praying for you. And it is this intercession of the saints that proves them to be saints in the first place. To be a saint, you must be in heaven. How do we know that somebody's in heaven? Well, there's a very detailed and rigorous process to become a saint called canonization. I'm not going to go into all the details of the process. But basically, a person is proven to be a saint by miracles that are attributed to them. Uh, they interceded in a miraculous way. And it has to be proven that this person uh, alone was the one that was asked for intercession. So if you were praying to a number of saints for uh, you know, a cure of cancer, uh, as well as your deceased grandmother for a miracle, and the miracle happened, well, you wouldn't be able to attribute that miracle to your deceased grandmother because you involved other saints in the process. You, uh, that miraculous intercession has to be proven to be that person alone that uh, is seeking to be canonized a saint. Also, it has to be a real miracle. It can't be like something like, well, I lost my phone and I prayed to St. Anthony and then all of a sudden I found it. That's it's a miracle, but it's actually not a miracle. So uh, the miracles attributed to the saints in their cause for canonization, they're almost always medical miracles um, because they're the easiest to prove that we have no idea how this could have possibly happened. Uh, things like sudden and unexplainable curing of an illness or a terminal illness or a disability such as deafness or being crippled. Uh, if you were a regular saint who lived a holy life in this world, like most of the saints, you you need to have two miracles attributed to you in order for formal canonization to take place. But if it's proven that you gave your life for your faith as a martyr, then you only need one miracle to be proven. 
And then, of course, there are what St. Therese refers to as, as, you know, the little saints, the little flowers, that they'll never have an official canonization by the church, but uh, there are certainly people that we know and trust are, are in heaven as well. So that's the saints in general. Next, we need to talk about the subject of today's holy day, Mary. Uh, as Catholics, we believe four different doctrines regarding Mary. Uh, these are the four that are required for the Catholic faith. There are different feast days of Mary throughout the year that celebrates these four doctrines, and you've heard me talk about those feast days before. So today, this is going to be just a brief overview of those four doctrines, uh, not nearly in depth of what I would normally go to on, a, for example, today's feast day regarding the Assumption. But the first Marian doctrine that we believe is that Mary is the mother of God. Uh, that is the official title given to Mary in the year 431 at the Council of Ephesus. Uh, we celebrate the feast of Mary, the mother of God, on January 1st. And the reason this is, I refer to as the first and you know most fundamental uh, Marian doctrine is that we believe Jesus is God. He is the second person of the Trinity, so Mary must be considered the mother of God. It's problematic if you don't, because if she isn't the mother of God, then you have to deny the first truth of Christianity, and that is that God became human, that Jesus is God. If Mary's not the mother of God, then Jesus isn't who he says he is. And if we deny that Mary is the mother of God, we deny Christ. So to call her the mother of God doesn't mean that she created God or came before God. It means that she brought God into this world. That's what mothers do. And this first doctrine of Mary leads to the other three. Uh, the second doctrine of Mary uh, is that she was a virgin mother. And this affirms the fact that Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit, uh, that he did not have an earthly father, that he, he was, in fact, God's only begotten son, and Mary's perpetual virginity was an outward sign of that, and also an outward sign of her complete devotion to God, not just in her soul and her heart and her spirit, but also even her body. Um, the third doctrine of Mary is that she was immaculately conceived in order to prepare her for her mission to be the mother of God. This is what we call the immaculate conception. And essentially what that means is that Mary was created in a state of sanctifying grace, that she was preserved from the effects of original sin from the moment of her conception. And this gift was given to her to prepare her for her vocation as the mother of God. So Mary being conceived full of grace as uh, the angel says uh, when he appears to her at the Assumption, it, it, it is a preparation for the child that she would bear, that he was no ordinary child, but the son of God. And so it's fitting that God would prepare a holy place for his son to be born, and that's what Mary is. In our first reading today, we heard from, uh, I think it was Second or First Chronicles, First Chronicles, and it's the story of where David brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And you might think, well, what in the world does that have to do with Mary on this feast day? Well, Mary is the fulfillment of the Ark of the Covenant. It's one of the images used for Mary, that uh, she is the, the resting place of God's spirit, God's presence, uh, just like the Ark of the Covenant was in the Old Testament. Um, uh, I had a professor in the seminary, he said, I remember he was preaching on the actual Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Our chapel was named the Immaculate Conception Chapel, so we always had a big celebration on that feast day. Uh, we actually had a midnight mass, and then we had school off the next day. But uh, uh, anyways, uh, one of my professors, he said very simply but beautifully to explain the Immaculate Conception, he said that the Immaculate Conception me means that Mary is and was all about Jesus from the first moment that she ever existed. And... So finally, in 1854, Pope Pius IX officially declared that Mary was preserved from original sin through the Immaculate Conception, and of course we celebrate that feast day on December 8th. Which brings us to today's holy day, the Assumption, which is a natural conclusion that we can draw from the Immaculate Conception. This is where Mary, at the end of her life, was assumed, body and soul, into heaven. In the Assumption, Mary is sort of the first disciple of Christ to follow him completely, body and soul, to share with Jesus in the resurrection of the body. So what the Assumption does for us is it gives us you know, hope that we will someday share in that same thing, in the resurrection, uh, which is Jesus' complete victory over sin and death. And the Assumption of Mary is a direct result, as I said, of her immaculate conception. If Mary doesn't suffer from original sin, she doesn't suffer from the effects of original sin, and the effects of original sin include death. So she need not die. 
So at the end of her time on earth, she was simply assumed into heaven, body and soul. Uh, the assumption is Mary foregoing death altogether because she doesn't suffer from death in body or soul as an effect of sin. She doesn't suffer from sin in the first place. And so in 1950, uh, Pope Pius XII proclaimed the doctrine of the Assumption of Mary, and we celebrate the feast day today, August 15th. Now you might think, well, we're adding doctrines rather late in human history, aren't we? And the thing is, this is only putting the stamp on these doctrines that were believed uh, since the beginning of the church. We can find evidence of that in the writings of the saints. So what do these dogmas, uh, these doctrines of, regarding the saints teach us about Jesus and about the Father's plan for our salvation? Well, the saints are a convincing testimony of God's love for all of us. We might not always see God or feel God working in our lives, but when we look back on the history of the church and how, how it has worked in other people's lives, that can be an inspiration to us and a, and a great bolstering of our own faith. Um, so they show us what is possible through Christ. Mary and the saints are models of faith, and they are our bright star of hope in all things. So now we can move on to the less pleasant topic of hell. So this might not be um, the most kid-friendly of homilies, but we'll see how it goes. There's basically three points that the church teaches on this subject, and that is, uh, um, well, the first one is Jesus died so that everybody could be saved. God desires the salvation of each and every single person uh, there are some branches of Christianity that say, well, the people uh, that end up in hell were destined to be there from the very beginning, uh, and that's simply not true. There is not a single person ever created that was born to, uh, to go to hell. God would not do that. He would not create someone to spend eternity in flames. That is a terrible, horrible idea of who God is. The second um, question is that we can ask is, well, why did God make such a place as hell? If God truly wants everybody to be saved and he's working hard to make that happen, how do we explain its existence at all? And that's the second truth that every Catholic should know, that hell certainly exists, even though God wants all of us to be saved. The thing with God is that he won't force us to be saved. Um, he never forces himself on us in any way. He could, of course, but he doesn't. He would much rather that we had the freedom to actually love him, which would require us to make a choice for him. We aren't mindless robots that he has just created to have someone to worship him. Uh, he made us to share in the love that, that is at the heart of the Trinity itself. And being able to do so requires free will on our part. It requires us to choose to love. Otherwise, it wouldn't be love. Um, just as some of the angels rebelled against God using their God-given freedom, their free will, human beings are capable of doing the same thing. The fallen angels, Satan, and his followers, uh, demons, they rejected God's offer of love, and, and so they're perfectly or permanently cut off from God's love and God's truth. And that state of existence is what we call hell, uh, separation from God. And we can choose that separation just as the fallen angels did. Which brings us to the third thing that we should know as Catholics about this topic, and that is that God doesn't send people to hell. People choose it by choosing to reject God's offer of love. Uh, There's an exorcist in Rome. During one exorcism, he uh, said to the demon, now go back to the hell which God has made for you. And the demon responded by saying, you know nothing he didn't make hell, we did. The, those are the three things about hell that every Catholic should know. First, God wills the salvation of every single person. Two, hell exists for those who reject God. And three, God doesn't send people to hell. People choose to go there, and they're led there by the lures of Satan and his temptations. Now, believe it or not, there are some people who want to go there. Uh, that's what uh, Satanists uh, believe, because... Um, well, they see it as every desire that they've ever had being fulfilled. They consider themselves rebels, and that's where rebels go. Heaven is a bunch of praying and playing harps and sitting on clouds, and above all, heaven is boring. It means that you are submitting yourself to the will of God. Hell is a nonstop party, though, on the other hand, where you get to do all the fun things that God told you that you shouldn't do, and the church has told us that we shouldn't do. Now, don't kid yourself. We've all had sort of temptations like that, right? Not as overt, but... That's what temptation and sin is. It's 
We want to do the opposite. We want to follow our own will. We want to oppose what God has told us. We want to rebel against him. But Satan is the father of lies because hell is nothing like all of those desires being met. There is no, nothing good or enjoyable about it. Um, St. Teresa of Avila, who is a 16th century Carmelite nun uh, in Spain, she is a doctor of the church, meaning that uh, she has bestowed a great deal of wisdom uh, on the church in the form of her writings. That's what a doctor of the church means. And in one of the chapters on her book on the spiritual life, she describes what she calls the four torments of hell, what you will actually experience. Uh, and it's good from time to time to be reminded of these terrifying realities. So here's what she has to say. Um, these are the actual words of God the Father to her, uh, and she's writing them down, uh, this vision that she received from God. The first torment of hell is that these souls are deprived of seeing me, me meaning God. This is so painful for them that if they could, they would choose the sight of me along with the fire and the excruciating torments rather than freedom from their pains without seeing me. So the, the break of communion with God is more painful than all of, the, all of the pains of hell. The second torment is ceaseless regret and agonizing about what has been lost. For when they see that their sinfulness has deprived them of me and the company of the angels and made them worthy instead of seeing the demons and sharing their fellowship, conscience gnaws away at them constantly. The third torment of hell is that their suffering is even worse because they see the devil as he really is, more horrible than the human heart can imagine. You will recall that when I once let you see him for a tiny while, hardly a moment, as he really is, you said after coming to your senses again that you would rather walk on a road of fire even until the final judgment than to see him again. But even with all that you have seen, you do not know how horrible he really is. The fourth torment is the ceaseless burning of an immaterial fire that has as many forms as the forms of the sins that were committed and is more or less severe in proportion to their seriousness. So in other words, he's saying that God is saying that the, our suffering will be in proportion to our sinfulness and it will kind of match the sins that we fell prey to. Uh, For on their bodies will appear the mark of their evil deeds with pain and excruciating torment and when they hear with terror those words, depart, you cursed ones, into the everlasting fire, soul and body will enter into the company of the demons with no hope of return. They will be engulfed in all the filth of the earth in as many ways as their evil deeds were different. The miserly will be plunged into the filth of greed, engulfed at once in the burning fire and in the goods of the world that they loved so inordinately. The violent will be engulfed in cruelty, the indecent in indecency and wretched lusts, the unjust in their own injustice, the envious in envy, and those who are hateful and bitter toward their neighbors will be engulfed in hate. Their disordered love for themselves, out of which grew all of their wickedness, will burn and torture them intolerably, for along with pride it is the head and source of all evil. So will they all be indifferently differently punished, soul and body together. So um, sometimes it's helpful to have the AT devil hockey stick scared out of us, right? Uh, after St. Teresa was given the shortest, slightest glimpse of hell, uh, it only drove her to newer and newer heights of prayer and devotion. But the consolation, there is a, a good ending to this homily, um, the consolation is that we know the truth. Jesus is the truth. And, and the truth is that he didn't destine any one of us to the torments of hell. Hell exists for those who choose it, but God desires the salvation of every soul. And thankfully for us, that desire of our salvation is fueled by God's infinite mercy. So we can certainly end with good news. We, all we have to do is turn to scripture to find out how, God, uh, how generous God is and how he desires the salvation of every single person. So let's go to a parable that was in the gospel reading earlier this week, um, Tuesday or Wednesday, one of those days. Uh, Jesus, it's, it's the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Jesus told his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out at dawn to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with them for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. Going out then about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you too go into my vineyard and I will give you what is just. So they went off and he went out again around noon and around three o'clock and did likewise. Going out about five o'clock, he found others standing around and said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? 
They answered, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you too go into my vineyard. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, summon the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and ending with the first. When those who had started about five o'clock came, each received the usual daily wage. So when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also got the usual wage. And on receiving it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last ones worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who bore the day's burden in the heat. He said to one of them in reply, my friend, I'm not cheating you. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what is yours and go. What if I wish to give this last one the same as you? Or am I not free to do as I wish with my own money? Are you envious because I am generous? Thus, the last will be first and the first will be last. So the point of this parable, one of the points, parables have many layers to them. But what God is telling us is that he is willing to give us until the very last moments of our life to turn to him. Even the workers who only began their work at the end of the day with an hour left in the workday, they're given the reward of an entire day's work. God is so generous that to us humans, it doesn't seem fair. That's the reaction in the parable. They don't think it's fair. But God is more than fair. God is mercy itself. Even if we delay to turn to him, he will give us paradise if we eventually do. Even if we wait to the very end, God will be there waiting for us. Think of the famous event at the end of the Gospels where we meet the good thief on the cross next to Jesus. These two thieves are crucified next to him for probably more like being revolutionaries rather than thieves, but some of the gospel accounts describe that both thieves are at one point ridiculing Jesus. But in the end, the good thief, who we know as St. Dismas, he has a change of heart. He says, we have been condemned justly for the sentence we received corresponds to our crimes, but this man has done nothing criminal. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied to him, Amen, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. One moment of faith is all that it took for God to save the good thief. God, at the last second, rewards him with eternal life. And that's why we can never say or determine whether or not a particular person is in hell. Even history's most evil of characters, Hitler, uh, Emperor Nero, Stalin, American politicians, we can't know their fate because we can never know the true disposition of their hearts in their last moments. God will give a chance to anybody, given the smallest amount of faith. He loves us that much. So great is his mercy. And that brings up a rather good question that I mainly get asked by young people. Um, if we can just wait to the last second, like the good thief next to Jesus on the cross, well, then why not be naughty up until then? Uh, you know, why not just live however you want to live and then at the end of your life, change your ways? And there's a few answers that I can give to that, that question. Number one, how do you know when the end's going to be? Uh, number two, will that conversion really be sincere if you waited until the end to have faith and you waited on purpose? Is that really faith? And then there's a third response that I would give, and that's going to take a bit more explaining. Uh, when thinking of heaven... And thinking of the saints, I often think of the words of St. Therese of Lisieux, who compares the saints to flowers in a garden. In her autobiography, she writes, I understood that if all the flowers wanted to be roses, nature would lose her springtime beauty and the fields would no longer be decked out with little wildflowers. And so it is in the world of the saints, uh, of the souls, Jesus' garden. He willed to create great souls comparable to lilies and roses, but he has also created smaller ones and these must be content to be daisies or violets, destined to give joy to God's glances when he looks down at his feet. Our Lord is occupied particularly with each soul, as though there were no others like it. And just as in nature all the seasons are arranged in such a way as to make the humblest daisy bloom on a set day, in the same way everything works out for the good of each soul. Now the reason I bring this up is because this vision of the saints and this vision of the heaven uh, of heaven is... It shows us that there can be different degrees, even in heaven, uh, in our relationship to God. If there are big saints and little saints, then it must be possible to have a stronger or weaker, or at least less strong, uh, relationship with God, even in heaven. 
And uh, I talked about this many weeks ago when I was explaining the major differences between Catholics and other Christians, and that is, the main one is our, our understanding of grace. Grace, for Catholics, is having a relationship with God. And for many Christians, it's sort of all or nothing. Uh, either you have accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, or you haven't, and that's basically all that's required. That's the only decision that's required for heaven. And yes, of course, God is merciful. He is compassionate. Um, but he's also just. For those who have ignored God and their neighbor and sought to serve themselves their entire life and said that they can't possibly expect to sit down next to that same God and those same neighbors in heaven. Um, so we as Catholics believe that a relationship with God is more like exactly what it sounds like, an actual relationship. And like all relationships, it can be strengthened or weakened. And it's something that you have to always be working at. So to me, the thought of saying that Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior being your only requirement to get into heaven, that's sort of the same thing as being Facebook friends with somebody, right? You click a button and all of a sudden you're a friend with it. Uh, presto. Um, it's basically an on and off switch. But really, that's not how God works. Uh, he's a real person. And so he wants a real personal relationship, uh, not just a virtual one. And like any friendship or relationship, it gets deeper and more meaningful the longer and and more that you work at it, the more time you spend together. Um, the Catholic understanding of grace, I would say, is dynamic. It changes depending on things like communication and dedication. And that understanding extends into our understanding of, of life after death, which brings me to my point. You don't want to wait until the last minute to follow Christ because of that developing relationship that we have throughout the course of our life. No matter what, in heaven, you're going to be perfectly happy. You'll be perfectly close to God, but what if I told you that you could be even happier than perfectly happy? And I know that sounds silly, but think of it like this. A teacup can be full to the brim, and you'd say that it's full. And then uh, also you can say that a swimming pool full to the brim is also full, but they're not exactly the same thing. There's way more water in the swimming pool. And that's sort of what St. Therese is talking about. The big flowers in God's garden are like that full swimming pool. Um, there can always be more. They're both the small flower and the little flower and the big flowers are perfectly happy and content, but we can always be closer to God because there's, there's no limit to love. Um, we can always be more fulfilled. There is no end to goodness and love. Why would you wait until the last second if we can deepen that relationship and that happiness right now? Uh, so that's my argument for the young people that ask me, why can't we just wait? And that brings me to the actual topic of what I wanted to talk about today, uh, five minutes and 24 seconds into this homily. Uh, for many people, perhaps even most people, the deepening of our relationship with God continues after our life here on earth, uh, but also before we get to heaven. Uh, heaven is perfection. Everything in in heaven is perfect. You wouldn't really want to get to heaven if it wasn't perfect. If there's things that were imperfect in heaven, it wouldn't be heaven anymore. So that must also apply to us. We must be perfected by the time that we get there in as much as our capacity to be perfected is, whether we're a big flower or a little flower in God's garden. And so uh, we must essentially be mirrors of God himself. We must be saints. That's the definition of a saint is to be in heaven. So to enter into heaven with an imperfect soul, it'd be like you know, those bad dreams where you realize you're in school, but you're not wearing any clothes. Or, uh, you know, it'd be like going to prom in sweatpants. Uh, you wouldn't want to be there. So the truth is, is that some people do, of course, reach their full potential, their full perfection on earth. That's, that's what the saints are, the martyrs, the saints. But there is also an in-between. Uh, we can die in a relationship with God, but not quite fully perfected yet. We can be saved from hell but not yet quite ready for the perfection of heaven. We can be singing in the right tune, but we might be a little bit sharp or a little bit flat. When we choose to sin, uh, our relationship with God is like a mirror that's been hit with a hammer. It's been shattered to pieces. The pieces are still there, but when you try to look at the image of God that we were created in, that image is distorted. There's a spider web of cracks through it. In the sacrament of confession, it sort of glues that mirror back together and uh, we can once again reflect our creator, but we can still see the cracks. There's still little chips in it. The broken mirror still has to have those cracks polished out somehow. And that's really what we call purgatory, where 
we have our imperfections purified until the mirror of our soul perfectly reflects God in the best capacity that we have. Um, Purgatory is the final preparation for heaven where the finishing touches are put on our soul. You can think of purgatory as sort of like a waiting room for heaven. It's part of heaven, really. Um, uh, We have our reservation made, but there's still some preparations to make, right? Uh, We're saved from hell for sure. Nobody in purgatory is ever going to end up there uh, because uh, at that point our earthly life is over. We've already made our choice for God uh, and our salvation is guaranteed. As someone who, personally speaking, will probably spend a good deal of time there, I'm glad purgatory exists. Uh, It exists because God is merciful. Our faith is not all or nothing. Uh, It is a relationship with him. And God can purify us as long as we make that ultimate choice to follow him, no matter how late in life that might be. And that purification happens uh, in purgatory. And God is so good that he's made it possible to help others through their purification in purgatory. You know, our prayers. uh, They they can't do anything for somebody in hell. They're not getting out of there, and and they're of no use to anybody in heaven. Uh, They're the ones that are praying for us in that case. But when we pray for the dead, it's to assist them in their purification through purgatory. And this can happen um, in a number of ways. Basically, I'm going to talk about three ways, um, the, the just regular prayer, indulgences, and the Mass. Uh, the biblical foundation for this practice comes from the second book of Maccabees. Um, if you're not familiar, in, these, in the book of Maccabees, Judas Maccabeus and his brothers leads the men of Israel, uh, mostly Jerusalem, in a war against the Greeks who are occupying and persecuting Israel. And after one of the battles, he notices that some of his men who were killed uh, were found to be wearing these sort of amulets that were you know, some pagan superstitious symbol around their neck on a necklace. And of course, you know, they, they died fighting for God's chosen people, so they're most likely not in hell. They were essentially martyrs. But Judas Maccabeus thought that they needed extra prayers because they were superstitious and they wore these amulets that were pagan in origin. And so here's what the second book of Maccabees says that he did. Turning to supplication, they prayed that the sinful deed might be fully blotted out. The noble Judas took up a collection among all his soldiers, amounting to 2,000 silver drachmas which he sent to Jerusalem to provide for an expiatory sacrifice. In doing this, he acted in a very excellent and noble way, inasmuch as he had the resurrection in mind. For if he were not expecting the fallen to rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he did this with a view to the splendid reward that awaits those who had gone to rest in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Thus he made atonement for the dead that they might be absolved from their sins. This passage, to me, clearly... Uh, demonstrates the practice of praying for the dead. Um, and and uh, so much so that Martin Luther removed this book from the Bible because, well, Martin Luther wanted to get rid of the idea of purgatory. Um, so the three ways, uh, like I said, we can simply pray for somebody in purgatory, but we can do more. We can offer what's called a plenary indulgence. Um, a plenary indulgence, what it does is it helps to sort of polish out those cracks in the mirror that I was talking about for somebody else, or even for ourselves, actually. Um, so it's basically, it's a designated prayer or uh, act of devotion uh, that you direct toward somebody, uh, uh, either yourself or somebody else. And there's an official list of things that I'm sure if you Googled plenary indulgences, you'd find hundreds of them and have your pick. And But there are a, you know steps to follow in obtaining a plenary indulgence. First of all, you do the thing, which, like I said, are hundreds of things you can choose from, like, saying a certain prayer, making a visit to the Blessed Sacrament, or praying in a cemetery, or praying the Rosary, the Stations of the Cross. There's a lot of different things you can do. Uh, after that, you must also go to confession and receive communion either uh, eight days before or after. So you got a 16-day six, window uh, uh, around the prescribed action. And then uh, finally, uh, well, second to last, you pray for the Pope's intentions. You can do this either generally by just praying for the Pope, or you can actually look up on the Vatican's website Uh, what his intentions for the month is. And then finally, the final requirement to obtain a plenary indulgence is that the one performing the action um, must be, uh, quote-unquote, free from attachment to sin, even venial sin. And what that means is that essentially it's like the state of your soul once you've just gone to confession. You have made a, uh, no matter how weak you are or how likely you might fall back into sin, you have made the choice to avoid sin. Uh, That's the freedom from attachment to sin. 
Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about today that you can do to, uh, for the souls in purgatory is to have a mass offered for the faithful departed. The mass is the most perfect form of prayer, uh, and it's one of the best things that you can do for somebody who has died. Uh, you can have a mass offered for anybody, living or dead, um, but most often they're for the souls in purgatory. They don't have to be Catholic. They can be for anybody. Um, uh, sort of the way, I'm just going to give you some of the technical details of how to do this. Fill out the envelopes there in the back of church. It makes it much easier uh, if you fill out the envelope requesting the Mass to be offered. Um, if you don't specify a date on the envelope, it's just going to go into the waiting list, which is months long. So if you if you want it sooner, specify you know an exact date or maybe just a month. Um, if you don't specify a date, it'll most likely land on a weekday several months from now. The Sundays, they tend to get requested first. Um, uh, I can't take the Mass intention any further out than a year in advance, so uh, wait until at least a year beforehand that you want to offer it. Um, this, there's a fee, the standard fee for having a Mass offered is $10. Uh, by church law, I'm not allowed to take any more than that unless you specify in writing that you want to offer more. I don't know why you would do that. but uh, So, for example, if you write a check for $100 and you ask for a Mass, you're going to get 10 Masses because that's what church law says. Uh, so uh, please use increments of 10. Some people don't, but it makes it a lot easier if you use increments of 10. Uh, you might say, well, geez, paying for a Mass, isn't that kind of corrupt? Didn't that kind of cause the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago? And, uh, well, that's what the $10 limit is for, to, to prevent, you know, scandals and money, things like that. And secondly, the Mass intention fee is part of my salary. So uh, it's sort of like tipping a waiter. Uh, so uh, I appreciate it. Um, but uh, if, you, if you request a Mass by check, please make, at least in our case in this parish, or in our parishes, please make them out to St. John's, uh, not St. Germanus, not to me personally. That's the way it works with our, our bookkeeping. Right now, um, St. John's is rather low on Mass intentions. St. Germanus has plenty the last month. Uh, but St. John's will be out of Mass intentions within the next few weeks if we don't get a new one. So if you'd like, uh, I could provide you with a list of people who have passed away in recent years. Uh, the last question to answer regarding this topic is, what happens if the person I'm praying for, or offering plenary indulgences for, or offering masses for, is already in heaven? Are my prayers and masses, you know, wasted? Um, while it's true, those who are in heaven don't need to be prayed for, they've already got them made, but it's, it's also true that God puts all of our prayers to work, no matter what they are and who they're for. They'll go toward somebody that needs them. Um, and that's one of the most beautiful things about our faith. We can be praying for and helping someone along in the process of their purification, someone that we don't even know, someone that we've perhaps never even met. And that's all because we are one body in Christ. We are one church, both on earth, in heaven, and awaiting heaven in purgatory.